Hello and welcome to Fire of Learning, in collaboration with the channel Eastern Roman History. The Fourth Crusade, which consisted of a series of events lasting from 1202 to 1204 and ending with the sack of the city of Constantinople, could hardly be called a proper crusade. In the long term, sacking the capital city of the medieval Roman Empire, what historians call the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire, would do more harm than good to the crusading cause. It would not be the end of the Byzantine Empire, but it was a mortal wound, and the destabilizing event would ultimately assist not only in the Islamic takeover of the Middle East, which the Crusaders sought to reclaim, but also, a century later, part of Christian Europe itself. Itself. Why then was a Latin Christian crusade redirected against Eastern Greek Christians? Understanding this is important to understanding pre-modern and even modern history. There are two angles from which to look at this. In this video, we will be looking at the chain of events immediately leading up to the Fourth Crusade. In the video done by our collaborator, Eastern Roman History, the long-term chain of events will be reviewed. I would highly recommend checking that video and his channel out when you're finished here. Now then, let's get to it. 1192 AD the Third Crusade, which saw prominent historical figures like Richard the Lionheart of England, Philip II of France, and the Sultan Saladin, has come to an end with the Treaty of Jaffa. It has been a partial success for the Crusaders. They managed to take a number of territories, such as those surrounding the cities of Acre and Jaffa. However, the grand prize, the city of Jerusalem, remains in Muslim hands. To reach the east, the Crusaders generally had to pass through the territory of the Byzantine Empire, which at this time ruled this territory here. Though appearances can be deceiving, the Byzantine Empire was fragmenting, facing serious internal issues. This state of affairs was well received by the Crusaders who had taken issue with the Empire since the beginning of the Crusades, quarreling with them often. The distant origins of these quarrels will of course be discussed in our counterparts video, but it essentially boiled down to a power struggle between the Byzantines and Crusaders over the reclamation of the eastern lands, and exacerbated by the fact that the Church of Byzantium had split from the Church of the West, meaning that in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Crusaders, the Greek Orthodox Christians were schismatics at best, and heretical false Christians at worst. Despite being Christian, the Byzantines were much more of a third party during the Crusades, not necessarily an enemy, but oftentimes in the way. This was not the only point of tension between the West and East. The Maritime Republic of Venice, always seeking to expand trade and commerce, found the Byzantines to be in the way of their growth in the Eastern Mediterranean and Black Sea. This had led to regular tension, conflict, and bloodshed between the two peoples. Continued Byzantine weakness in the coming decade would encourage the Western Latins to strike a blow against the Eastern Roman Empire, which they sneeringly called the Kingdom of the Greeks. During the Third Crusade, German troops under the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa had even clashed with Byzantine troops, owed to their mutual distrust and frustration. The Byzantines feared that Barbarossa might be a little too close with the neighboring Serbians and Bulgarians, with whom he could ally to challenge Byzantine power. The island of Cyprus, furthermore, which had broken away from the Empire, had been captured by England's King Richard the Lionheart during the Third Crusade, and instead of being returned to the Byzantines was sold to the Templar Knights, becoming the Crusader Kingdom of Cyprus in 1192, adding to the tension. In 1195, the Byzantine Emperor Isaac II of the Angelos dynasty, viewed as incompetent, was overthrown by his older brother, Alexios III in 1195, who took power while the Emperor was on campaign against the Bulgarians. Isaac was not killed, but he was blinded and imprisoned in Constantinople. His son, also named Alexios, was imprisoned with him. But in 1201, Italian merchants smuggled Prince Alexios out of prison and took him to the Holy Roman Empire, where he lived in exile, claiming to be the true heir to the throne. Emperor Alexios III revealed himself to be little better than his brother. Meanwhile, in Europe, Pope Innocent III was preaching for a fourth crusade in the Holy Land. Though slow to react, troops from primarily France, Flanders, the Holy Roman Empire, and Italy met in Venice to prepare for it. The intended target, this time, was 
Egypt, the new power base of the Islamic Ayyubids who prevented the recapture of Jerusalem. Take Egypt for Christendom, the Crusaders thought, and Jerusalem would fall shortly thereafter. The Republic of Venice, under their doge, Enrico Dondolo, spent a year constructing a fleet to ship 35,000 Crusaders to Egypt. The fleet had cost Venice a huge effort and a pretty penny to construct, but would certainly pay off. However, when the crusading force assembled, it consisted of a mere 12,000 soldiers whose leaders could only pay the Venetians 35,000 of the previously agreed 85,000 silver marks. Some crusaders had chosen to sail from other areas of Europe. The Venetians were, justifiably, quite angry and pondered on how to fix the situation, detaining the crusaders in Venice and squeezing every last penny out of them to pay for the expedition. It was too late to disband, but they couldn't just erase such a massive debt, of course. Dondolo then came to a solution. The Crusaders could be used to perform a service for Venice. He offered them an opportunity to assault the city of Zara in the Adriatic, which had revolted against Venetian rule not long ago and had aligned with the Kingdom of Hungary. The problem with this was that many were uncomfortable with the notion of a Crusader army attacking a Catholic city under the rule of King Emmerich, who had himself been enthusiastic about crusading in the past. Pope Innocent III forbade this adventure and threatened its participants with excommunication, though this information was hidden from the army. Having nothing to do with protecting Christendom, the Venetians and the Crusaders went ahead with the assault, viewing it as necessary to complete the crusade. Zara was taken in November of 1202 and looted. After some squabbling between the Venetians and Crusaders over this loot, they got back to business, focusing on an expedition to the Islamic world. The Pope was furious and excommunicated the army, but later lifted the excommunication to the Venetians, whom he felt had coerced the Crusaders into the act. He then ordered the army to proceed to Jerusalem, as they had vowed. However, there was a prominent exile in Germany who had a better idea. Boniface I, Marquess of Montferrat, had returned to the Holy Roman Empire before the assault on Zara, possibly to avoid excommunication. While there, he met the exiled Prince Alexios. During their meetings, Alexios made him a tempting offer. Help him reclaim the throne of Byzantium, and as emperor, he would provide the Crusaders with 200,000 silver marks, 10,000 soldiers for the Crusade. 500 knights, which would guard Jerusalem at the emperor's expense for the rest of his life, and the use of the Byzantine navy for crusading purposes. Furthermore, perhaps most radically, he offered to place the Orthodox Church back under the authority of the Pope in Rome. It was quite an offer, but was it too good to be true? Almost certainly, and some crusading leaders, like Dondolo, knew that, but nevertheless it still presented a great opportunity for the crusaders, as they could most likely get something from the venture. Many, but not all of the crusaders agreed. The Pope was not happy about this expedition either, but was not initially as resistant to it. The army assembled, and in June of 1203, they arrived at the great city. The Byzantines were vulnerable. They were, as mentioned, enduring a period of strife in the empire, and had a mere 15,000 soldiers guarding the city itself, being unable to summon more in time. However, these soldiers were positioned behind one of the most well-defended cities in the known world, successfully holding in the face of overwhelming odds before. Furthermore, 5,000 of these soldiers present were the Varangian Guard, Anglo-Saxon and Scandinavian mercenaries known far and wide for their efficiency in battle. There was to be no famous Greek fire here, however. The information on how to construct these medieval flamethrowers, which had saved the city on multiple occasions before, was kept so secret that it was lost by the Byzantines themselves. Still, this army seemed ample to stand up to the 20,000 crusaders and sailors who agreed to take part on the expedition. The objective of the crusaders was to remove Emperor Alexios III from the throne and place Prince Alexios IV on it so that they could receive his promised tribute, or at least whatever they could realistically receive from him. 
Prince Alexios and the Crusaders were hoping for a mass resistance from the city's inhabitants to achieve this goal, but they soon found that the people of Constantinople were much more accepting of Emperor Alexios III than was realized. Accordingly, a siege to capture the city became inevitable. Throughout July, the Crusaders and Byzantines duked it out, each attempting to gain the advantage over the other. Eventually, the Emperor decided that it was time for courage. He took his forces out to meet the Crusaders head on. But as soon as he did so, his courage broke, and he ordered an unnecessary retreat back behind the walls. This helped break the morale of the army, and the Emperor Alexios fled the city soon after, taking a good portion of the Byzantine treasury with him. Byzantine officials then recognized the previous emperor, Prince Alexios' father, the blind Isaac II, as emperor. This was an unexpected turn of events. The Crusaders, despite the fact that their superficial goal had been indirectly achieved, were anxious to get what Alexios had promised them, and demanded that Alexios IV be raised to co-emperor. This was agreed. Alexios IV, now in charge, did indeed find it impossible to raise the promised funds, resorting to melting down important Roman and Byzantine icons to help pay the debts. This angered his people, and even with this, the debts were not paid, angering the Crusaders. Alexios IV asked for more time from the Crusaders, and was given six months to deal with the deposed emperor, who sought the throne again, but ultimately he would fail. With tension growing and conflict erupting again, the people of Constantinople sought to depose Emperor Alexios. Eventually, a man named Alexios Dukas, also known as Mordzuflos, which is what we will call him due to the number of Alexioses involved here, rose up as a prominent leader of the anti-crusading faction and deposed Alexios IV, later having him strangled to death. He became Alexios V. The payment to the Crusaders was certainly not coming now, and so battle erupted once again. After a period of fighting, Mordzuflos himself fled, and on April 13th of 1204, the city was taken by the Crusading army. For three days, the city was ravaged, with the Crusaders accumulating far more wealth than they had originally been promised by the exiled prince. Many works of art and architecture were destroyed, and for the time being, the Byzantine Empire itself was fractured. Pope Innocent III was furious and excommunicated them. But would it ultimately help the Catholic cause? For a time, it seemed so, as it satisfied both the ambitions of the Crusaders and Venetians. Several Crusader states were carved out from the Byzantine Empire, including the Latin Empire centered in Constantinople, which was ruled by Baldwin I, the Count of Flanders. Theoretically, this would facilitate passage to the Holy Land. Furthermore, Venice had crippled its commercial rival, and taken some territory for themselves. Thirdly, it had eliminated the center of the Orthodox Church, restoring the people of the land to the Catholic Church. However, ultimately, all three of these accomplishments were short-lived. Three Byzantine rump states held on. They would eventually restore the empire and kick out the Crusaders. However, the empire would not be what it had once been, and the mortal wound caused by the Fourth Crusade would open the door to a new, far more dangerous rival to enter the scene. But was Byzantium's weakness following the Crusade truly a result of the Crusaders' blunder alone? Certainly not. As mentioned, this incident was the result of decades, and in fact centuries, of decline in Byzantium and tension with the West, as well as many other factors. To learn about these key issues, once again, a video has been produced by our collaborator, the channel Eastern Roman History, the link to which can be found in the description. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, I invite you to come check out the rest of Fire of Learning, and to subscribe to see more videos like this in the future. To help support the channel, a donation on Patreon would be a big help. A special thanks to our current Patreon supporters, once again listed here. We are also on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, so come check us out there too. If Karisto for watching.